What's up everybody, Chad here coming back from the Purple Room and today for DC Saturdays I am coming to you guys with a review, a little bit of a deep dive but not too deep on Jeff Lemire's and Andrea Sorrentino's Green Era run from the New 52. So a little bit of context, uh, Lemire and Sorrentino jumped on the Green Arrow book in 2013 with number uh, 17 and they ran all the way through number 34. Now this is actually one of the most revered runs from the New 52. If you talk about the New 52 and it, all of its creative teams you get Greg Capullo and Scott Snyder on Batman, you get Jim Lee and Jeff Johns doing the Justice League and this one as well you get Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino doing Green Arrow. So, a little bit of context to the New 52. So, it was an event where the DC Universe was reset in its continuity, and not all the characters, but almost all the characters got a brand new history, or a condensed history. So, in this new universe, all the superheroes have only been around for five years. Batman for five years, Green Arrow for five years, Superman for five years. So they're all relatively young. They're all supposed to be in their mid to late 20s or at least very early 30s. And so they're inexperienced, they're brash, and that is very much seen throughout this Green Arrow run. So if you guys aren't familiar with Green Arrow, his real name is Oliver Queen. And originally he was the protector of Star City, a West Coast city. He uses a bow and arrow. He's very much like Robin Hood. Um, and he has that kind of mentality, steal from the rich, give to the poor, but always protecting the poor people. Uh, in his private life, Oliver Queen is in fact a billionaire, a playboy, a billionaire vigilante, much like Bruce Wayne, but instead of a bat kind of um, motif, he goes for the Robin Hood motif. So, we have a young Oliver Queen here, and instead of Star City, the New 52 reset it to being Seattle, a little bit more grounded. Uh, which is very interesting. I thought it was a u unique kind of spin. The New 52 kind of did this a couple of times. In previous DC continuity, you had the Teen Titans operating in San Francisco or operating in New York City. But most other superheroes operated in fictional cities. Like you would get Midway City or Fawcett City for Shazam or Captain Marvel. But now in the New 52, you get Star City is now just Seattle. And Captain Marvel, or Shazam in the New 52, is operating out of Philadelphia. So the, they kind of did this to kind of more ground it in our world. Much to the chagrin of older fans, to me, I couldn't really see a superhero operating in Seattle as much as I could operating in Star City, because Star City, a fictionalized place, you can kind of make it however you want it to be. But bygones be bygones. So... To get into a spoiler-free review of this book, I very strongly recommend it. The biggest pull on this book is Andrea Sorrentino's beautiful art. He he does things that are just so unique to every page. Um, I love his pencils, and it's just, he does it so well. And you get this juxtaposition where you get these, these rainy kind of fights next to these black, white, and red action images and it, it is done incredibly incredibly well um San Sorrentino does such a wonderful job he's one of my uh favorite artists if I see a work by him I tend to pick it up even if I'm not familiar with the writer so I have to talk about the packaging I picked up the um deluxe edition of Lemire and Sorrentino's run this collects numbers 17 through 34 and also includes um, Green Arrow number 23.1, Green Arrow Futures End number 1, and Secret Origins number 2, uh, number 4 I mean. I'll get into those as they come up in the book. Um, but their run, for being such an impactful New 52 run, it was relatively short. So in just less than 20 issues or around 20 issues, Sorrentino and Lemire were able to create a defining Green Arrow run. So, I definitely recommend it. It's not necessarily S tier. It is A tier, though. I would give this a thorough 9 out of 10. And that is a consistent rating throughout the book. 
Um, some issues I would actually argue are closer to a 10. Um, however, overall, uh, as a run, the average has to be a 9 or a 9.2 or 3. It is very solid, and if you guys are big fans of the Green Arrow or the television show Arrow, definitely pick up this run. It's definitely worth your time. Before Lemire and, Sor and Sorrentino jumped on the book, and the Senti had written about 10 or 15 issues. Uh, JT Cruel and Dan Jurgens had written a couple issues prior to the Senti jumping on. Um, but those individuals didn't have long runs with the character. So this was the first uh, Green Arrow creative team that lasted a substantial portion of the New 52. So, since Green Arrow's universe has been reset with the New 52, he's younger and he's much more brash. And this picks up right where uh, you would expect it to. You don't really need any context of what happened with Oliver Queen in the previous runs. You just need to pick up these issues and read it all the way through, and you can definitely enjoy it without that prior information. I definitely recommend picking up the Deluxe Edition because it is printed in that oversized hardcover format. And also, you get this beautiful spread of... The Emerald Archer himself firing his bow, and it's Sorrentino's beautiful art, so you cannot go wrong. And the best part about the oversized hardcover is, of course, all the pages are blown up, so you can really, really appreciate all of the fine details of Sorrentino's art. Uh, one of the things he does that I really, really, really like is throughout his panels, he will have a, a, a series of shots, but in those panels, he will highlight other events and he will do so like for, for instance here you have Ollie firing his grappling hook and you see it click uh, click on and all you see is the green and the rest of it's black and white and it highlights it to kind of give that little moment a little bit of emphasis and it really helps to exaggerate the dramatic flair of the instance and these kind of scattered panels pop up throughout where you'll have It'll highlight something in the background, and then it'll it'll show a uh, blown up version of that in the main foreground. Um, but I have to say, it is a very very cool technique. It is something that I don't see everywhere, and Sorrentino does not overuse it. Uh, but it works incredibly well for this visual medium. Like for instance, here Green Arrow is um, experiencing some ear some hearing loss, some e some hearing damage. So they have put a little box around his ear to remind you. Um, of what he's feeling there. So it works incredibly well from a storytelling pr uh, perspective and it works incredibly well for a comic book as well. It is something that well, I wish more writers did, had more fun with the medium. More artists, I mean, had more fun with the medium and it definitely, definitely makes us, enhances the story and it doesn't detract you from the events. It makes the events seem a little bit more visceral and makes it seem like the stakes are a little bit higher. Alright guys, now to get into a little bit of spoiler territory here, I'm not going to spoil the book, you guys can definitely still read this book and enjoy it, uh, I'm just going to kind of give my overall thoughts on the story, and critique it a little bit, and we'll go from there. So the first arc, The Killing Machine, basically it takes Oliver Queen, Green Arrow, and like it says in the cover flap, everything changes in an instant. There's been a hostile takeover of Queen Industries, which is Oliver Queen's bread baskets where he gets all his money. Uh, hostile takeover, and he loses control of his company. And then he, he Oliver Queen gets framed for murder, and he has to go on the run. All the while, this other archer named Komodo is after him, and it is, of course, you know, the anti-Green Arrow, you could call it. Um, so... What this this kind of opening run, it basically resets Oliver Queen to basically putting at him back at the bottom so that Lemire and Sortino can have their way with his character progression and do what they would like. So I mentioned before how he's a much younger and more brash character um, than we have seen in other continuity, and that is very much true here, and it is a little bit to the detriment of Green Arrow. So in the opening pages, once Green Arrow finds, or Oliver finds out that his company has kind of been taken away from him, he realizes that he walks in and he's just yelling at his um, 
father figure after his father had left, um, Emerson, who is really in charge of the company, and instead of saying, um, like, oh, like, we need to do something, he just walks in and starts yelling at Emerson, saying, you've lost everything, he's blaming it on Emerson, and Emerson's like, well, maybe now you'll have to grow up, and because Oliver is very much immature at the beginning of this book, he's very immature for about two-thirds of this book, he doesn't really grow up, even though he is a hero, even though he's saving people's lives and protecting the innocent and all that, he's still this aggressive, bold kid. And at the end of his story, you do kind of see him grow up, and that is really, really rewarding. But you guys do have to muddle through ten or so issues of Ollie being immature and, and hot-headed, which can be a little bit difficult to handle, but Lemire pulls it off in a way that makes it all feel satisfactory once you get to the end. Now, the main thing driving this story, I wouldn't say is um, the characters. It is, this is much more of a story-driven story. So you have stories where the characters themselves are interesting and uh, encapsulating enough to kind of push it along, and there are tons of interesting characters here. There are tons of interesting villains, but I would honestly say that Green Arrow is not the most interesting here. It's more of Green Arrow's world that's more interesting here. So, after the killing machine, Oliver is left bereft, or so he says, but he is working with two, two new um, assistants, uh, side characters, Henry Fife and Naomi Singh. He's been working with Naomi Singh, from what I can gather, in um, the previous issues of the New 52 run, but I haven't read those. I've just read Lemire's. Uh, and then Henry Fife, he recruits who you, who both of these people used to work at um, Queen Core or Queen Industries, Q Core or Queen Industries, and now they're working for Green Arrow. Um, and Oliver is you know framed for murder, so he kind of has to disappear. He's no longer has access to his vast financial fortune, and he kind of has to reset. All the while, he stumbles uh, on a conspiracy that involves his father, it involved a group of people called the Outsiders. And if you get the outsiders have kind of taken on many different forms, but in the new 52 form is something that I really appreciate, something that, that I thought was a really cool addition to the DC Universe lore. Basically, there's a number of clans. Each clan is controlled by a leader who is in possession of the totem artifact. So for instance, there is the spear clan, the arrow clan, the fist clan, the shield clan, the axe clan, the Sword Clan, and the Mask Clan. And of course, each clan has a totem artifact. The Arrow Clan has a literal green arrow, the Shield has a literal shield, and once you control these artifacts, you can kind of see your own future and destiny, and it enlightens you, so to speak. But it enlightens you along lines of your own life, so you see the course of it, and you can kind of make sense of how things in your life could add up, and that is something that comes into play uh, very, very um, interestingly, and we have this wonderful spread, but I'll show you once we get to the final, the second to last arc in the book. So after the kill machine, Oliver ha goes on a bit of a mission, he finds out about the outsiders, and he realizes that maybe he, him being washed up on the island that he was where he became the Green Arrow wasn't so much of an accident. So, if you guys aren't familiar, Oliver Queen, basically, he was uh, partying at, in, in, this, in this continuity on an oil rig. It was attacked by terrorists, and he washed up on an island and it, with a bow and arrow. And in order to survive, he had to regain his lost archery skills and use that to survive. Um, a big portion of this book harkens back to his time on the island. In fact, issue number 25 is a tie-in to the Zero Year event where it was Batman's origins, so it goes back six years and shows Oliver Queen's first real appearance as Green Arrow. Um, so, if you guys are familiar with the Arrow TV show from the CW, I used to like it. I know it's it's not necessarily incredible art, but it, it is a decent enough superhero action show. Um, this will definitely entice you because this deals a lot with the island, and it almost feels like a lot of this was written around trying to attract those Arrow people to read comic books. However, I wouldn't say, I w a lot of times that is a bad thing when the comic book medium tries to cater to the 
more mainstream outlets like television and movies. However, Lemire and Sorrentino pull it off really well. Uh, it actually, this is a preferred version over the era of television show in terms of the lore and how that a lot of those stories kind of go down. So after Oliver kind of fi finds out about the outsider clan, he is told that he has to basically follow these dragons, and one of these dragons he finds out is in Vlatava, which is where Count Vertigo is actually the king of. Uh, Vlatava is like this Eastern European picture like Belarus, uh, but a very much smaller country. Picture Sar uh, Sarkovia, if you guys like the MCU. Just a small Eastern European country, um, and it's war-torn, it, you know, picture Yugoslavia or something like that, um, and Count Vertigo is in control of it. So, Vertigo, he is one of the more interesting Green Arrow villains. He's crossed over, he's been in Batman the Animated Series, but basically his powers are that he has a device that's um, tapped into his, his mind, and he can send out these psychic blast waves causing people to uh, vertigo, A, eh? and also just incredible discomfort and pain, and if put on you for long enough, you can lose your mind. Um, just an incredibly cool character. And so Oliver goes to Vatava and finds out more about his past, um, some secrets about his father, but of course he, he fights Count Vertigo, and kind of starts a grudge with Vertigo, and that's the first the first interaction in this continuity is in these pages, so this is the start of the, not arch-nemesis relationship, but similar to that. Um, and all the while, because Oliver's on this soul-searching quest, and he's going to Vlatava and trying to fight Count Vertigo, um, all the while there is a shadowy figure named Richard Dragon, who is trying to take over Seattle's underground. Uh, he's taking out the other crime bosses, so you really get the idea that Seattle is this crime-infested city. It is this place full of just organized crime, and Green Arrow is really needed there, because as soon as he leaves, somebody rises up and just causes immense chaos. So, the next, there's a small issue um, here in number 23.1, where in the New 52 there is an event called Forever Evil, and it occurred in October, I believe. Uh, but that was in to October 2013, I want to say, was deemed Villains Month. And Villains Month, basically, every, like all the ongoing comics got put on pause. And they were replaced with number 23.1. And instead of being, you know, Green Arrow, it was Count Vertigo. It was still Green Arrow, but it was, you know, focusing on Count Vertigo. So... The, the one shot, number 23.1, is actually one of the best issues in the book. It gives a very, very cool backstory on Count Vertigo. You see his origins, his childhood abuse, the experimentation that was put on him, um, his relationship with his mother, and how he really lost his throne in Vatava and then had to go regain it. Very cool stuff, and in, for one issue, it is packed incredibly solid and honestly this is one of those issues that the run benefited from more than anything. I am willing to say actually I think Lemire and Sorrentino had a plan for Villains Month because a lot of the other Villains Month issues were kind of just eh. Um, there was like four or five Batman issues that came out that month which were just it was just way too much because they wanted to talk about Bane and the Joker and Harley Quinn and just so many villains whereas Green Arrow just focused on one villain and wrote a really good story, and it really enhances the overall quality of the run. So, after that, you basically, uh, Oliver kind of is, is still trying to find out who he is, uh, all the while, and, you know, all the while, um, Vertigo, like, so Vertigo, like, number 23.1 is placed between Oliver going to Vatava, and then, for revenge, um, Count Vertigo comes back to Seattle, and they duke it out there. So there's this really cool fight tearing up the streets of Seattle. Um, Oliver's other kind of... He's, he's, he's injured here, so he has other people working for him. Shadow comes into play. If you guys know Shadow from the old Green Arrow continuity, she comes into play here. Um, but, of course, 
they need the green arrow to uh, really win, and you get this really cool moment of just, this really shows the effects of Count Vertigo's uh, mind blasts. So you see Seattle on the top there, and you see that giant green wave just causing pain and distortion to everybody in, in that radius. And then in that middle panel, you really see the fragments and kind of the loss of sanity that Count Vertigo can cause. And then you get that really cool bottom imagery of Green Arrow fighting through it, getting ready to overcome it. And, of course, the good guy always wins. And he lands a punch on Vertigo. Really cool. Um, he And then, of course, collapsing. And I love, after he collapses, a Seattle police officer grabs him and says, I got you, GA. Um, so while Oliver Queen is exiled for, um, you know, because they believe he murdered Emis Emerson in the beginning. Um, Green Arrow still has a secret identity, so he's still able to be Seattle's hero, even though his alter ego is unwanted. So, at the end of issue number 24, you get a, uh, weird, occur a weird occurrence, which, which kind of, it, like, if you guys are familiar with our work at all on the Ryan and Chad channel, we talk about how much we love Donny Cates. Check out our Venom review. Uh, and there's something Donny Cates uh, does where he basically rewrites the war, not retconning it, but adding in important details that really enhance the overall feel of the run. This is, and this Lemire and Sorrentino story is very much a Donny Cates-esque as it, it revigorates the Green Arrow War, it, it, but it doesn't retcon it, it just pumps it full of new and exciting things. And one of those new and exciting things, and this is directly from the Arrow television show, is Diggle pops up. So as soon as Diggle pops up, you guys know that they were trying to cater to that Arrow audience because the show was incredibly popular. And of course, they want to attract as many people as they can to reading comic books. So they'll say, oh, Diggle's in the Arrow, in the Green Arrow book now. Go go check it out on shelves. So basically, the, uh, Lumiere retcons it to where Diggle and Ollie were together right at the start of Oliver's time as Green Arrow. And number 25 is when we see that start. So number 25 goes to the tie-in issue. Um, it's called the Prodigal Son of Green Arrow in Zero Year. So there we have um, Green Arrow in this overgrown city, which was Gotham at the time, surrounded by bats. And this is the first meeting between Green Arrow and Batman. And basically, Moira, Moira Queen, Queen's mother is trapped in Gotham, and Green Arrow, right after coming back from the island, goes to save her, Batman shows up, Diggle is one of the bodyguards for uh, Mrs. Queen, uh, you get this really touching moment between Oliver and um, his mother, and then it alludes to Oliver's struggles on the island. So orig in original continuity, the island was just like a barren wasteland, then with uh, about around 2008 or 2007, Somewhere around there, um, Andy Diggle did a the Green Arrow Year One story, which was basically four issues about Green Arrow's time on the island. He expanded it to not just being, oh, I was trapped on an island, to expand it to being, I was trapped on an island, and there's a group of super, uh, super mercenaries there. So this takes both of those ideas, the island, the mercenaries, and then they put a new spin on it, which I don't want to spoil because it is a very interesting piece. Um, and at the end of issue number 25, you get the backup of um, basically Green Arrow recruiting um, Diggle into his fold. He basically becomes like a sidekick to him. Um, he doesn't wear a mask or a uniform really. He just wears a bulletproof vest and uses a gun. Diggle is not afraid to kill people. As far as I can tell, Green Arrow doesn't kill people unless he absolutely has to. Uh, but if he has to, he will. And then at the end of number 25, you get this little little spoiler, uh, a teaser here, where uh, Roy Harper is introduced to the fold, but that's all you really get. This is the only time Roy actually pops up in this run. He gets mentioned a couple of times, and I really wish that that wasn't the case, because five years into his superhero career, uh, I would think that Green Arrow would definitely still be working with Roy Harper, who was Speedy in the original comics, now he's Red Arrow or Arsenal, um, and that's one of the things New 52 botched, and that is not Lemire and Sorrentino's fault. At the, when the New 52 launched, there was Red Hood and the Outlaws, which consisted uh, of, of, of course, Red Hood, Starfire, and um, Red Arrow or Speedy or Arsenal, Roy Harper. So, 
that continuity was established as Roy already being on his own. So by the time this book would come along, he's Roy's already on his own. However, in continuity, Roy was only with Ollie for one or two years. So you didn't really get the, like, in order to train a sidekick, you need at least a year to do it, I would say. And then having less than a year to really have a sidekick, I feel like that, that character won't really get that much development and as a sidekick, but I digress. Um, that's one of, one of my gripes with New 52, is certain events of continuity were just altered or gla glazed over, like Batman having four Robins in five years, and Wally West totally disappearing at the start of New 52. Um, I just wish that there was just some more depth there to the history of these characters, because they, they sped it up, and at the same time, while that works for the case of Green Arrow, and in this book he learns to grow up, um, I can't see him really being a good mentor to somebody when he's so immature, and maybe that's why he and Roy had a falling out. So, after number 25 and number 26, if you guys don't know how to count, uh, is The Outsider's War, and it is um, subtitled The Return to the Island. So this goes over Oliver's origins and his struggles on the island, and that's kind of interspersed throughout the main story of Oliver chasing down the totem Green Arrow. He finds out some wicked reveals about his own history. It makes him question whether or not he actually had any any play here in, in his own story or whether or not he was um, just a pawn. And he is kind of getting led around here by Shadow, who's trying to show him these things while also withholding a lot of information. Um, and, of course, Oliver has to fight some of the other clans. And the first clan he does at the fight is the Shield Clan. And one of the things that Sorrentino does really cool was a whole page will be onomatopoeia. Um, like here it says crack over the whole page, but each letter kind of shows you a little picture so you can kind of see Kodiak here, who is the leader of the S.H.I.E.L.D. clan, attacking Oliver, and it is just so, so cool. And um, Sorrentino does that a couple of times, uh, but he's not afraid to play around with the format, and that's why I definitely recommend getting this an oversized hardcover, because you can really appreciate the small details, because some of the small details that he will put a box around and then use black and white to kind of highlight it, those are very hard to catch in the single issue comic books. I used to read those when they were coming out regularly, but I missed a bunch of the issues, so now I finally got it collected, and here's another instance of that onomatopoeia kind of painting in a picture in the words, and it's just such a unique kind of take on the genre and you gotta love it when comic book artists aren't afraid to break the bounds. So Oliver ends up going on this kind of globe trotting adventure and if you're asking yourselves well he's separate from his money how does he do it it's kind of glossed over he is part of the JLA um, which a book was ongoing at this time so and it is mentioned that he has a salary from that much like how the Avengers originally had a salary for being on the Avengers team. Uh, he says it's not a lot but it's enough to live on and it's enough to keep up with his gear um, and that's kind of a detriment, but I'll get into the things I don't like about this run at the very end once I go over the overall uh, story. So, Oliver kind of comes into contact with the Outsiders. Uh, some things are revealed to him. It is revealed in uh, way back earlier in the issues that he actually has a half-sister. Um, Emiko and... Um, she she, she kind of comes into play here. She gets to make a decision about what, whether or not she wants to stay with the Outsiders or not. Um, and then Green Arrow does, of course, obtain the um, the totem Green Arrow, which would make him leader of the Arrow Clan, and he becomes enlightened. And there's this really cool moment where um, as soon as he touches it, he sees his entire future here, his past, his present, his future, everything. And this is him, Oliver Queen, becoming enlightened. And you see some, there's some really, really, I would say, um, tantalizing and evocative, provocative imagery here. This appears to be at Green Arrow's funeral, and you see what appears to be uh, Supergirl, Captain Adam, and I cannot tell who else, but a couple of heroes at Green Arrow's funeral, possibly JLA members. I think, I believe one of them might be Stargirl. Um, but yeah, overall, just hinting that of Green Arrow's demise. Maybe he fakes his death, I don't know. Um, and it's just a really, I just love how, how this image, Oliver, Oliver's face, is made up of tons and tons of smaller images. So once you get the heart, the oversized hardcover, you can really look at and appreciate all of the imagery. 
Uh, it is just this beautiful kind of tapestry. I would love to have this as a poster or something just because this is something that you don't get in comic books a lot. This took a lot of time and a lot of care, and I have to give it to Sorrentino for absolutely killing it. As we move on, the, and the Outsiders War comes to a close, Oliver had kind of been separated from Seattle for a while, and all the while, Diggle, Fife, and Naomi are kind of in Seattle trying to, trying to form a deal between all of the different crime factions and crime families trying to keep Seattle from burning down. But it all, of course, backfires, and by the time Oliver goes to Seattle for the final arc of Broken, uh, which honestly has some of the coolest covers in the run, even though they're all cool, um, just to kind of jump back a little bit, some other covers here are, for instance, you get the Arrow Clan, and the Arrow Clans is uh, Enlightenment, Steadfastness, and Lineage. Uh, there's, of course, the Shield Clan, which is... Um, there's the Sword Clan, which is Speed, Precision, and Soul. So each clan had its own cover, and you got these kind of just basically what they stand for, just three words about what their thing is. Uh, in, in our usual recording studio, uh, we have a Green Arrow issue hung up. I believe it's the Axe Clan. It's the purple one. Um, and it, it, it is one of my more... more it, it is just an interesting take on comic book covers. Yes, here's the Axe Clan one. Um, I just love it. I just love that they did this. Um, it kind of adds more lore just in the cover about all these different clans. So, finally, Oliver returns to Seattle, uh, reconnects with Diggle, um, and has to fight Richard Dragon, who has recruited um, Count Vertigo. He's recruited um, Killer Moth. He's recruited uh, the Red Dart, and he's recruited Brick. Uh, a bunch of Green Arrow villains that not haven't necessarily gotten the spotlight um but in this book um they kind of have a little bit of a showdown and it is an incredibly emotionally satisfying conclusion and um and then it kind of wrap the in the final pages of number 34 it kind of wraps up uh where oliver queen's at he's basically cleared his name of um the, mur the, the murder charge from way back in the beginning of the book because oliver queen although he's been important and integral to this book his public life has kind of been totally absent from this book, and I think that's kind of to a positive, because if they really tried to squeeze in what Oliver Queen was doing, which was, Oliver Queen wasn't doing anything except doing Green Arrow missions and finding out about his own past and his own family secrets. Um, so, trying to squeeze in, oh, by the way, Oliver Queen has to hide, it, or whatever, it just doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't, it would have detracted from the story. But at the very end, they do return it to form, Oliver Queen comes back, he gets a an insurance settlement, so we can kind of set up these um, these uh, foundations for the homeless, uh, honored at honoring his mother, um, and it shows Fife, Henry uh, Fife, uh, Henry Fife, and Naomi and Oliver kind of getting along again. Uh, everything is kind of returned to status quo here, and then the final the final image is a shot of uh, Emiko and Oliver have kind of come together because she demands to be trained and demands to be an heir to the Green Arrow legacy. Uh, and that's what this book is about, lineage, and about passing the roles on. And, of course, the Green Arrow um, 80th Anniversary Edition book has a beautiful story in it, written by Lemire and Sorrentino, where it's kind of like Green Arrow being a revolving cycle, and I would definitely include that little story as part of the Deluxe Edition if they were to reprint this, because that story is integral to this kind of mythos. So... The final, final issue is the the Future's End event, which was the last issue Lemire and Sorrentino worked on, um, and it takes place five years in the future, and you kind of see, it's just such an interesting story, and what's, what, what kind of, a little bit of a, a problem, the only problem I have is that it finally returns Green Arrow and Oliver Queen back to a place where I would feel Oliver should have been at the start of the New 52, because... Oh, I mean, Green Arrow had had tons of history in the previous continuity. He was this kind of age-old, this veteran of the superhero community. Uh, even though he doesn't have any superpowers, he's just a wicked good archer, and he's he's one he's one of the best, uh, he, the best physically and um, in terms of just uh, heroicness a, a human being can get. And um, but in the in the future's end book, you do see him kind of in that form. And you see him planning, and he's not as brash, he's more steadfast, and he's, 
plotting out a chart for himself. He's no longer letting Destiny decide what he wants to do with Oliver Queen. He's letting Oliver Queen decide what he wants to do with his Destiny. So it's just a really cool send off to the character. It does take place five years in the future. Um, so it could all potentially happen as it goes on. But of course, these kind of future events aren't really for the purpose of showing exactly what happens. It kind of just leaves you, oh, I'm excited for the future of this character. I wonder if other writers are going to take it in this direction. <sighs> so guys, that was a lot just about the story. And it is a very dense story. I love ton, tons of stuff in there. Um, there's tons of secrets I didn't reveal um, for you guys to definitely dive in. Um, but now for a little bit of a critique. So when it starts off and Oliver is separated from his fortune, that gets glazed over and it doesn't really work out. Um, I mean, he still has a salary, he's able to travel the world, he goes from Seattle to Vladava, from, um, the, uh, from Seattle to the island, he steals a helicopter from Argus, because he has connections there. Basically, Oliver being separated from his fortune does not ruin his character, he's not forced to just live in the, live in the gutter or make arrows out of cardboard he finds. He basically it doesn't really affect him at all, it kind of frees him from focusing on Oliver Queen, and he can, it, it, like, it almost works in his favor, him being on the run and not having any money. Um, but that's just one critique. Another critique is it kind of sets up this love triangle between Fife, Naomi, and Oliver. Um, and it doesn't go anywhere. It, at the end, you get a little bit of catharsis on it. But that's all we get. Um, we're not really, sh I'm not sure if um, later writers did anything with that. Because I haven't read anything after or before Lumiere and Sorrentino's Green Arrow run in New 52. I've read a little bit of the Green Arrow Rebirth run. I can't say who wrote that off the top of my head, but that was decent. Um, I know Green Arrow, he's usually a very political character. He's left-leaning. He was the mayor of Star City in the previous continuity. Um, in the Rebirth series, it kind of leaned more into that um, leftist politics. Um, which is fine if you're going to have a character be openly, like, left-leaning. That is fine. You're allowed to have opinions, and you're allowed to, to show perspective. Uh, but I know Ryan and I kind of talk about how we don't love politics in our books, um, which is true unless it's handled well. Um, oftentimes it isn't handled well, but in a lot of the Green Arrow books it has been handled well. Um, I remember in the Justice League cartoon there was a, um, um, a line where they're debating whether or not the government should have kind of domain over the Justice League. And Green Arrow says, I'm an old lefty. I believe that the, that the government is there to protect the people from what they can't protect. And then Superman says, well, who's going to protect the, gov the, the people from the government if, the, uh, if they step out of bounds? Um, just a little cool dialogue there. It shows that both sides do have a point. Um, it's, not calling, it's not just outright trashing one side or the other. Um, this stays away from politics almost entirely. You have one moment where Oliver Queen talks about being done with the system and wanting to just uh, say that money and, and that everything was distracting. I need to focus on becoming a better Green Arrow, which he does. He leaves behind th that kind of rich boy Oliver Queen um, history and just leans heavily into being Green Arrow and becoming a man. And he does so by the end of the story, and it's really rewarding. Um... At the, at, at the very end, in Future's End, there's one, there, there's a little bit of the more left-leaning stuff where Oliver appears on a talk show and he's talking about um, how he wanted to make technology and better housing um, more accessible because he believes that things are a right, not a privilege. Um, kind of just extending human rights a little bit. Um, but it's not, it's not stupid or grievous like a lot of comic books have done. Um, it handles it with care and um, delicacy and it's, it shows, it, and it's an important feature of who Oliver Queen is. Uh, so if you were worried about, oh, I hear Oliver Queen's like, you know, in the comic books, he's super left-leaning. He is, but in this book, you don't really see any of that. So you're, um, if politics is something that scares you away from comic books, don't be afraid of this book because it's really not mentioned very much. I think maybe twice. Um, the Love Triangle doesn't really work out. Um, it's kind of shoehorned in there. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, some of Lemire's dialogue is a little bit rusty. I don't really feel like these are real people talking. Um, it Sometimes it works really well, but sometimes it's just a little bit of a problem. Um, like, right before, like, like after, 
you know, Richard's dragon is taking over Seattle. He, he monologues to this guy, kills him, and then says, I've come to take Seattle. Um, I don't really, that doesn't seem realistic to me. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever, if you're from Seattle and you've ever tried to take over the city, drop a comment, let me know. Let me know what you said. Um, I don't know if anyone would have said that, though. But, I mean, overall, it's not necessarily a grievous, and the story had me just chugging along through issues. I, I would just read one after the other, and, and even though I kind of knew what happened, because I read it eight years ago, I was still, there, there were bits and pieces that I forgot, or that I, uh, issues I didn't get. So, I was still chugging along. I was reading this rapid fire. I was like, I need to know what happens. I was invested in the story. Uh, and that's something that, you know, the story kept me going. Um, I also, it did, it tied a lot into the Arrow TV show, which is actually more of a positive than a detriment, uh, because it enhanced the lore of Green Arrow in the comic books. Um, it really did a lot with the island stuff. The Diggle stuff was a, felt a little shoehorned. I was thinking, okay, there's like, my suspension of disbelief gets a little bit worn thin because Diggle was an ex-cop, then he was a security guard for the Queen Industries, and then he's kind of working openly with Green Arrow. He doesn't wear a mask or anything. You get several references to where the Clock King knows who Diggle is, uh, so it's not like Diggle has a secret identity. And then at the very end, when Oliver Queen is kind of um, stepping back into the light and retaking back his personal life, um, he's on stage, and standing next to him is Diggle, um, Oliver, you know, Green Arrow wears this tiny little domino mask, and when he doesn't have his hood up, um, it's all he's wearing is a mask, and I feel like a lot of people would put the connection together that, oh my gosh, Green Arrow and Oliver Queen are the same person. Um, so, of course, Green Arrow has had his identity leaked before, he's been outed, um, uh, and so maybe, maybe it's leaning towards that direction, um, who's to say, but, um... Overall, I have to say that this is a very solid read. Um, there's just, like I said, there's a couple of plot points that don't add up. You know, Green Arrow losing everything and it doesn't really matter. All that does, all that serves to do is separate Oliver Queen from his personal life so we can just focus on his lineage and his legacy and his Green Arrow-ness or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the dialogues is a little wonky, but I mean, guys, the art is so beautiful. Almost any problem I have with this book is just made up for by the beautiful art. I mean, this is, it is wicked. Uh, Jeff Lemire has written a lot of really good stuff. Um, for instance, if you guys have seen that Sweet Tooth TV, uh, TV show on Netflix, that's a comic book by Jeff Lemire. Check it out. Dive into the community. Um, but um, it's th this is, he, he definitely becomes a better writer from the start. Uh, compared to the end of his run, and he was only on the book for like a year and a half. But he did a lot with it. You get 20 issues of solid stuff. This retails for, for 50 bucks, but I got it for 35. Amazon usually has it on sale. You can get it from Goodreads and other um, literature outlets for uh, a discounted price. I definitely recommend it if you guys like Green Arrow, if you guys like Hawkeye, if you guys like the Arrow TV show. If you guys like the Arrow TV show and you're thinking about getting into the comic books, this is the book for you because this has everything you would suspect, uh, expect from a Green Arrow book. This will make the most sense to you as an Arrow TV show fan. And this is what you guys should definitely relate to most if you like the Arrow show. Now, if you guys are old Green Arrow fans, this is honestly the most Green Arrow I've read. I haven't read Kevin Smith's Green Arrow run. I haven't read uh, Mike Grell's run on Green Arrow. I haven't read a lot of the old classic Green Arrow. Um, but I've read the Wikipedia article for Green Arrow's history at least twice because he has a more uh, interesting history. You know, he was mayor of New York. He got outed. There's all sorts of cool stuff with Green Arrow um, in the old continuity. But this, if, if this is a horrible Green Arrow book as a Green Arrow fan, let me know in the comments. I don't know. All I know is that this is a good book from my perspective of having read a lot of comic books. Um, so it's... This is a great story for anyone wishing to get into Green Arrow because you don't really need a lot of context. It explain there are some there's a lot of flashbacks and and it's a little a reinvention of Green Arrow's history in a lot of ways. Um, but there's tons of new stuff here as well. It, it pushes the story forward and introduces the likes of Emiko, which is definitely a legacy character to Green Arrow. In the future's end story, we do see her actually take up the Green Arrow mantle. Um, it's just a wonderful, wonderful story. And 
I cannot recommend it enough. Almost strictly for Sorrentino's art, guys. It's I just I want to show you guys the art all day long because it is so beautiful. There's so much good stuff in here, and it is incredibly, incredibly creative in terms of just its layout, the colors, everything is incredibly beautiful. So guys, this is a definite 9 out of 10. I definitely recommend you guys pick it up. If you guys are still here, thank you so much. Definitely subscribe. We release comic reviews all the time. Tune into Wednesday Warriors if you guys want to know what the hottest comic books in the shelves are right now. Let us know in the comment section what you would like us to see review. I know Ryan is coming out with Thor. You guys will see that on Monday. But also, I have Green, Air, uh, Green Lantern number 2 uh, by Jeff Johns coming out. All-Star Batman uh, is coming out. Uh, Volume 2 is coming out soon. Uh, it's in the works. I have the Amazing Spider-Man issue number 1 through 10, Spider-Man's Origins, back from the 60s coming out. Review on that. And, of course, we have our, Sn our Snyder deep dives that we're still doing. So there's tons more stuff. Tune in, drop a comment what you guys want to see us do, because we can always use suggestions. Let us know what indie books we should be reading. Indie books are so great, and we really want to get into more reviews on those, because we want to read more of those, and reviewing them is an excuse to spend a whole day reading comic books. So, thank you guys so much for everything. Uh, let us know what you guys want to see, and just pick up Green Arrow by Jeff Lemire and Andrea Sorrentino. This is a wonderful collection, and I am definitely going to read this a bunch more times, probably once every couple of years, because it is such a good story. So guys, thanks for tuning in. I'm Chad. We'll see you in the next one. Keep reading, everybody.